Welcome to the League of Women Voters Davis City Council District 5 Candidates Forum. Thanks to all the candidates for participating in our forum. This forum is co-sponsored by the Davis Media Access. Davis Media Access is a nonprofit community media center serving Yolo County. DMA's mission is to enrich and strengthen the community by providing alternatives to commercial media for local voices, opinions, and creative endeavors. My name is Mary Jo Bryan, and I'm the current president of the League of Women Voters of Davis. As many of you know, the city, council, the city of Davis and the Davis Joint Unified School Districts have moved from at-large elections, where we all vote for city council and school board trustees, to district elections, where we vote for a candidate who lives in the district where we live. The city, of, the city of Davis map on the screen shows City Council District 5. The district for the most part is South Davis, but includes some of Olive Drive and of course does not include El Mocero, which is not in the city limits. Our moderator tonight for, today, for today's forum is Bob Fung. Bob is one of our four board members and chair of the Voter Service Committee, which is responsible for putting on our candidates forum, including this one. Thank you. Thanks, Mary Jo. My name is uh, Bob Fung and I will serve as moderator for this afternoon's forum. Here's the forum format. Each candidate will give a two minute opening statement. After opening statements, candidates will respond to up to six moderated questions. Three of these questions were sent to the candidates a week before the forum. Each candidate has 90 seconds for their first response to each question. Candidates will be advised of their time with a 15 second and a five second warning from our forum timekeeper and a bell when their time has ended. Candidates will be muted when they exceed the time limit. Candidates, please mute your audio when you are not speaking. We have determined the order of candidates by random number drawing prior to this afternoon, and the candidates have been advised of their order of speaking. After the primary question responses are completed by all candidates, I will ask if any candidate wants to add a secondary response. Candidates will each have five opportunities during the forum for secondary responses of 40 seconds each. If there are no additional candidate responses, I will go to the next question. Candidates should indicate that they would like to make a secondary response by using the Zoom hands up facility. After all candidates have had a chance to add a secondary response, I will ask if any candidate would like to add an additional response and then move on to the next question when no candidate wishes to respond further. At the conclusion of the moderated questions and responses, each candidate will have one minute for a closing statement. We will disable chat at the beginning of the main part of the forum and, and enable it when the main forum is concluded to minimize disruptions to the candidates. Audience may submit questions for consideration by sending questions to ask.lwvda at gmail.com. Questions will be accepted until uh, six o'clock or when we finish the six questions, when, when the candidates give their closing statements, whichever is earlier. Questions should be aimed at all the candidates. Questions aimed at a single candidate will not be accepted. Audience questions will be asked in the final 30 minutes of our forum, or if we finish the six questions earlier, somewhat earlier than that, which has happened in the last forum. There will be a short break between the end of the main forum and the audience Q&A to give the forum question manager an opportunity to collate the questions. Mary Jo Bryan, our president, will provide League of Women Voters information during this break. We will close with audience questions where candidate responses will be limited to one minute 
and a secondary response of 30 seconds will be allowed for each candidate for each question. So just to repeat the uh, email, if you want to ask an audience question, it's ask.lwvda at gmail.com. Each candidate will now give their opening statement of up to two minutes by random drawing. We begin with Kelsey Fortune, followed by Josh Chapman, Connor Gorman, and Rochelle Swanson. Go ahead, um, Kelsey, when you're ready. Thank you, Bob. Um, it's hard being a young candidate. You get dismissed repeatedly. I'd like to remind you that I that these young candidates represent an important portion of our population and that we do have ideas of how things can be better. As a young woman, I have been talked over and dismissed and told to smile more times than I can count. Um, I'm really glad that we have this forum where we can actually talk about the important things that I have made myself available almost every day to talk with voters about. Um, I want to listen to all of you and lead Davis to a better, brighter future. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, you're next. Thank you, Bob. Um, my name is Josh Chapman. Uh, for the past 10 years, I've lived in South Davis with my wife, Athena, um, and my two boys, Owen and Quentin, who both attend Marguerite Montgomery Elementary School in South Davis. Um, I'm also the owner of Armadillo Music in downtown. Um, for the past four years, I was the president of the Davis Downtown Business Association Board of Directors. And then um, in the beginning of this year, wrapped up two years on the Downtown Plan Advisory Committee um, as a voting member uh, through the DDBA. Um, I also have a background in master's degree in education uh, with a focus on equity and social justice. Um, why I'm running, I'm running um, for, for, for this, my dad, when I was growing up, uh, my dad um, ran for school board. Uh, he was a bus driver in the town where I grew up. Um, and I remember as a kid carrying signs around and helping him campaign and listening to people call the house and leave messages on the voicemail and all those types of things. And um, there was just something about it that um, there was an impact about trying to make the community better uh, that resonated with me. Um, and that same sense of civic responsibility um, carried me to Washington, D.C. After I graduated college, I joined AmeriCorps um, and spent time teaching in Southeast D.C. Um, and then stayed on, was hired and worked uh, in a, a Metropolitan Police Boys and Girls Club there. Um, that also led me to get my master's degree in education with a focus on equity and social justice. Um, and I taught in San Francisco at SF General, working with uh, students with severe uh, mental health issues who were uh, incarcerated. Um, and I was a teacher in that school. Um, so when I, when I moved back to Davis 10 years ago um, to run Armadillo and raise my family, that same sense of responsibility led me to teach. I taught suicide prevention here for, um, for suicide prevention in Yolo County. So I taught suicide prevention and mental health awareness to seventh and ninth graders. Um, and then also I spent time as a volunteer as a, as a youth uh, coach and at my son's school. Um, so I, I look forward to this debate. I look forward to, uh, to answering questions. Thank you. Thank you. Josh, uh, Connor. So I also want to emphasize the importance of younger people as well as students and renters in our community. I do think that it's important for us to account for all of the different uh, communities in Davis and the different needs of different communities. And I do think that students and renters are a very important part of Davis and a group that has not been that strongly represented 
in city politics, including on the council in the past decade or so. So I think that it is important for us to get that representation. And as a student and a renter myself, I believe that I can bring such representation to the council. And simultaneously, I have also been involved in both UC Davis and Davis City politics for several years now. So when I first came to Davis about seven years ago, I fairly quickly became involved in labor organizing and worker and student needs. But a few years ago, I also started becoming more involved in city council politics and city, city decisions. And that started with me working with indigenous community members, trying to get the city to move its banking services away from Wells Fargo in opposition to the Dakota Access Pipeline. And it sort of evolved from there. So I believe that I have a good balance of a knowledge of city politics, as well as perspectives from marginalized communities in Davis. And I believe that I can uh, bring that balance to the council. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Rochelle. My mute wasn't working very quickly. Hopefully that's better. Um, thank you all for, for hosting this forum. And it was said earlier, it's great for us all to be in this same format. I think it makes for a much uh, more lively for, um, way for us to be able to talk about the issues. Uh, I first moved to Davis uh, in 93, having visited the year before to check out UC Davis. And so um, I've known South Davis as a, a poor college student, as a renter driving through big mustard fields. Uh, to today where, well, pre-COVID, we had ways traffic backed up in uh, very long waits even to go to the grocery store. So it's been quite amazing to see the changes in Davis over the nearly 30 years that I've been here, most of which have been in South Davis. Uh, my three boys have uh, been raised all the way here. My youngest just graduated this past June um, at the famous drive through <laughs> cap and gown pickup and have been very active. I started on the general plan um, in the very early 90s, shortly after I'd moved here, working on the general plan update. I've been a grand juror for the Yolo County. I, I led the effort with the Blue and White Foundation to build the largest classroom at Davis High, which is the outside stadium. And um, did two years, two terms on city council from 2010 to 2018. Uh, similarly to 2010 uh, is why I'm back seeking a seat in 2020. Um, at that time, there was a lot of dissension on the dais. We were in a recession and there was a lot of concern about what was happening. Our budget was unbalanced and there was a lot of fear of where things were moving. We were seeing families that were being furloughed, uh, often two income households from the university that were taking sizable cuts and noticing the, the need to have to have a cut in services. And so I had been asked then if I would please step up because um, I developed a reputation for bringing disparate groups together um, in a way to work together. And just like now, I was asked by community members starting in early spring, and it has just grown more important to see that there's experience and continuity from the last time we met many challenges. Thank you, Rochelle. Now we'll move to the first question of the forum. And the first question is, although the city council will continue to govern all of Davis, you are being elected by voters of a specific district. What are the top needs of your district and how do you propose to address them? And uh, let's see, uh, Josh Chapman will be the first to answer the question. Thank you. Yeah, so I think there are a few immediate needs. Um, one is, you know, the, the one is to have representation on the council um, and have somebody who is representing South Davis and looking out for um, the way money is allocated and the way that money is being spent and making sure that South Davis is getting a fair share of that. Um, so just having that voice there is extremely important. Um, the second piece that we have to figure out that's more immediate that I hear about almost every single day or with every person I talk to is figuring out and dealing with um, a solution to, to Mace Boulevard um, and how we address that and tackle it. Um, 
the third piece that, that we need to look at um, that I've been talking about since um, day one is getting the South Davis Library built, um, working with county leaders to actually see that through and use the voter funded money that is there to get that, that library built in South Davis. Um, the next piece I think we look at is the open space tax that was passed. Um, there is, uh, again, voter approved money um, that we look at the South Fork of Pewter Creek, uh, right up against South Davis, just um, on the other side of Mace, um, and look at using that, that, that money to create a more open space in South Davis. We can connect the piece that the city already owns. There's a vacant lot in the middle, and then there's a third piece that's owned by the county, uh, and working closely to purchase that piece of land and have almost a four mile loop of space for residents of South Davis to use. Thanks. Thanks, Josh. Connor Gorman, you're next. So I think there are a lot of different communities in South Davis and sometimes they have different needs and we really need to think about what different communities need and try to address the needs of different communities. But sometimes those needs overlap. And I do think that the a South Davis library is a good example of needs overlapping because I believe a South Davis library is something that a lot of South Davis residents have wanted. And in addition to benefiting the community as a whole, it would in particular benefit the school district. And it would also benefit some of the most marginalized, especially economically communities. Because for instance, these days you need good internet in order to do a lot of things, including just applying to jobs. And having a library as a place for people to go during say extreme weather events or when it's really hot outside is often a useful thing as well. So I think a South Davis library would address a lot of these needs, but we also do need to look at other needs as well. And I believe that another major need that would benefit the community as a whole, as well as the most marginalized is trying to restructure public safety and really look at a housing first approach to homelessness and uh, also. Thanks, Connor, for your response. Rochelle, you're next. You need to unmute yourself. Thank you. Um, well, there's definitely a myriad of issues. Um, I think the underpinning of all of them is making sure the sustainability of whatever programs or changes we want to see. Uh, when we do have different communities within South Davis, um, whether it's Olive Drive or around Puda Creek um, or out on Childs Road and even up around Aggie Lane. I think some of the, the pressing issues, especially right now in the middle of fire season is that we have one of the largest greenbelt systems that goes along the south part of District 5. Um, and that right now the staff is in the middle of thinning that. And I think that needs to be a priority to make sure that we are aware and responsible. I think equitable access to the other side of town is important, uh, whether it's Mace or uh, Pole Line Overcrossing or Richards. And thankfully those funds are coming um, forward. I think another thing for equitable transportation is also considering more bus stops and way that uh, Unitrans is able to pick up more people uh, that need to be able to get into other parts of town. Um, even though COVID has gotten traffic down, I think it's something that as we see people coming back to work, we need to be smart about traffic calming measures to um, disrupt the algorithms with ways so that we aren't um, further impacted even before the problems with Mace Boulevard. That was a significant issue in South Davis because of the exits that we go through. Um, and I do, I am hopeful that with some of the funding at the state and federal level around broadband that we can bring the library conversation back. Um, the city's brought money and property to the table and it will be great to see some programming with the school district and with the county, I think, bringing those extra funds on. Thank you. Kelsey, you're next. Yes, yeah, so there were a lot of things that um, the other candidates have mentioned. You've got the mace mess that needs to be addressed, as well as the fact that we've been sitting on for a long time a pile of money to build that South Davis library, and there just hasn't been anyone pushing that forward. Um, uh, you also need to think about the bike infrastructure, which is something that I struggle with in South Davis. Um, I've lived in other parts of Davis as well. 
And I can tell you that now that I'm in South Davis, I definitely bike on the roads rather than the bike paths because of the poor upkeep. Um, there are also things like Pacifico and um, homelessness that has kind of been pushed out of the downtown area into our neighborhoods that are very important issues for the South Davis residents. And I agree with Connor that we need to look at a, a housing first model um, for dealing with uh, populations that are unhoused um, for whatever reason and uh, rethink public safety in general. Thank you, Kelsey. Would anybody like to uh, submit a, a secondary response to that question? Uh, Josh, I see Josh's hand. Is that right, Josh? Do you have your hand up? Or maybe not. Okay. Well, um, no, Thank you. Yes? No, I'm good. Okay, good. Thanks. All right. And Connor wasn't on my screen, so. No, I'm good. Thank you. No, I'm yeah. good. Connor, did, did you want to have a secondary response? No? Okay. So um, let me ask, uh, tell the candidates if you need me to repeat the question, uh, if say you're a third or fourth in line and you just <laughs> let me know. Okay. So um, we'll go on to the second question. Uh, what is your position on reallocating public safety slash police funding in Davis? Please include specific examples. Connor, you're first to respond. I thought Josh was first to respond. I can respond, but. Uh, no, I think you're. Uh, it rotates. Josh was, was next, was last time, was first to respond last time. Okay. Kelsey was first, um, then Josh, and then now you. Okay, so what was the question again? <laughs> yeah. Uh, what is your position on reallocating public safety slash police funding in Davis? Please include specific examples. Okay, so I am very in favor of reallocating police funding to real public safety. And this is actually tying into uh, what I was kind of getting at toward the end of my previous response. So I believe that we need a separate department of public safety that is independent of the Davis Police Department. And I think that this department should hold things like mental health crisis response and substance use crisis response and homelessness outreach and those types of services, as well as shelters and respite centers that I believe Davis needs more of as well. So I think that this would be very helpful for certainly the populations that are directly served, but also the community as a whole because really creating real public safety in our overall community benefits everyone. And we know that policing does not create public safety. We know that policing does not actually address the issues that we are having in our society. And there are ways to redirect that funding in a much more effective manner. Thanks, Connor. Uh, Rochelle, you're next. Thank you. Um, well, I think, you know, words matter. And so I think reassessing um, is, a, is a very good term around this, around public safety, um, as well as reimagining. And, uh, you know, we're learning that public safety and public service is a much bigger uh, net that we need to catch right now. Uh, often many things fall into law enforcement's hands for which they're not trained. A lot of it around mental health, um, drug use, homelessness. And so I believe that we need to beef up more part of that. We only have now one um, officer we're looking at on part of a grant. We're putting in 60,000 for a clinician that specializes in crisis intervention and training. Um, I think that we should have more than that uh, just because those issues are not an eight hour a day thing, uh, 40 hours a week. I think we need to have more care. Uh, we've had a warm handoff project. So if, if somebody was um, been, battling with mental illness or drug abuse and, and, and having a law enforcement call, they were able to go to Communicare. Unfortunately, that's been cut. 
So I think we need to reassess what we actually need. And I think this is, a, in every district is a little more unique than others. You know, South Davis has two different freeway exits. So yes, we very much need to have, I think, crisis intervention training. Uh, I wanna see more in the day-to-day -day because I think that's how you also get at a culture. But at the same time, we need to hear all citizens' voices. We have a lot of citizens that are worried about their safety as well. Um, and are worried about just a cut or a complete change could actually leave them at risk. So I think it's important that. Thank you, Rochelle. Thanks for your response. Um, Kelsey, you're next. Three years ago, I was raped. Uh, two years ago, I went to the police. Nothing was done. If any other resident would like to tell me that the theft of their property and that they need an armed response for something that happened, you know, hours ago when they don't even know when um, is a bigger issue uh, than what has happened to me, they can go ahead. We can have that conversation. We need to be thinking about what is an actual crime that we need to be dealing with and reallocate resources so that the actual things that are happening in our community are taken care of. I'm in a minority of victims who actually go to the police because victims know that nothing is going to happen. We are in a college town. This is happening. We need victim services. We need mental health services. We need homelessness services. We do not need more armed officers. They don't help victims. They don't help people in crisis. They don't help our community. Thank you, Kelsey. Josh, you're next. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I am definitely in support of looking at and identifying ways that we can be better with the way the police department can, can better support our community. Um, you know, this conversation has to be had. Any of these conversations that are had or happened, you know, they happen at the city council. They also happen in our community. Anything that, that changes reallocation, it should be a city driven process where we have multiple voices around the table, different views, different um, experiences to make that decision a well-informed decision. Um, you know, the vast majority of the calls the police department receives um, is not violent crime. Uh, most of those calls that they get are dealing with somebody who is in a mental health crisis or is in need of some support of support services. Um, so, you know, I do support us looking at and coming up with more holistic approaches to how we look at policing. Um, you know, somebody having a mental health crisis is not a criminal and we need to look at how we respond to those situations as a community, as a police department and better address the needs of the people who, who, are, who, who are looking for that support. Um, even when people are behaving violently, medical professionals, you know, they are able to handle those situations. I've worked in hospitals um, dealing with kids who were having mental health crises and I'm not an, I was not an armed professional and I was able to de-escalate and help through that process. So we know that those types of, um, that type of um, process can work. Um, you know, I think that we can use funds, the grants that the county is getting to implement, like I said, a more holistic approach to this um, and reform methods of de-escalation and wrap services are completely consistent with. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Uh, would anybody like to make a secondary response? I don't see any hands. I'll go to the next as the third question. Oh, there's a there's a hand. Kelsey, go ahead. I just wanted to say that I do have a plan for this. I'd like to see a Department of Public Safety that contains police, fire, EMS, your typical three, as well as a Department of Mental Health Services, a Department for Homelessness Services, and a Department for Victim Services. Um, that way we can have professionals at every single level who are meant to deal with different situations. Um, we hear a lot about these different response services where there's co-response, that type of thing, not actually working very well. And part of that is because when you're dealing with someone who's in crisis, bringing them in and then releasing them back onto the street is not actually serving them. We need to have background as well. Thank you, Kelsey. Connor, you're next. Thanks for uh, putting your hand up. 
Yeah, so I just wanted to uh, mention why I do believe that this should be a separate department. So I essentially think that it needs to be independent of the structure and culture and budgeting and decision processes of the Davis Police Department. But I also would be happy to look at a potential uh, joint model. And I do think that that would be a possibility too. So at the moment, I'm in favor of a separate department, but I also think that there are merits to a joint one as well. Thank you, Connor. We go on to the third question, which is what more can a city do to curtail climate change? And uh, Rochelle will speak first. Thank you. Um, there are a number of things we can do, both big and small, to curtail climate change. Um, we've actually done some great things by adopting the Climate um, Adaptation and Action Plan. We have wonderful uh, groups within Davis, like Cool Davis, um, that's really worked with the community. I think we can definitely do more. There, you know, look forward to the updated plan. Uh, there's been a great focus on new development that comes in about being very energy efficient um, from small single family homes to large projects like DISC. Um, and I've been saying this for a long time and I still continue to feel that we need to put more investment in our existing housing stock. Uh, that is actually where we have a lot of energy loss that's not, you know, already something that's built today in 2020 is going to be significantly energy efficient um, just from the materials and the windows and the better practices. But we have older homes that are here that are 30, 40, and 50 years old that could be significantly upgraded. I know I've done it in my own home and see a big impact. Um, and we have, you know, I think, so that's one way to do it. And that includes affordable housing. Often there is a challenge to be able to get at that. Um, I think being able to, like I mentioned earlier, more transportation routes, even with Unitrans and with other public transportation that makes it easier um, by improving our infrastructure. And then from a big picture is joining some of the regional consortiums that are looking at macro ways as well as micro ways to address um, climate change. And it puts us and the ability to share grant funding and expertise. And we already have an amazing brain trust here. And I think we would be very well served to join that regional consortium on climate change. Thanks, Rochelle. Kelsey? Yeah, so I think that the first thing we need is an updated general plan. Um, we need to be thinking about climate when it comes to every single decision that we make as a city. So whether, it, whether we're talking about, you know, large, um, development projects, or whether we're talking about, you know, something as small as a specific intersection, what we're looking at when we're talking about transportation or, you know, public health, literally everything, we should be including climate in that conversation. So one of the big things that I would like is a commission specifically dedicated to climate. Um, our commissions do fabulous work putting together um, their own expertise as well as reaching out and figuring out where everyone is, uh, where the best information is. Um, I also believe that we need dense infill. One of the biggest things in Davis is that people want to live here because they work here and they play here. And if we move people to where they work and play, they will drive less. And that is a huge part of our footprint right now is people commuting. So when it comes to projects like DISC, which say that they're sustainable and clean, um, we need to look at the bigger picture and realize that DISC will create 5,000 additional commuters from the surrounding area. Thank you, Kelsey. Josh? Thank you. Yeah, I think that, you know, we can and should be doing everything we can to get to net zero carbon emissions as soon as possible. Um, you know, on a larger scale, you know, we know that there's a huge portion of companies that are, um, you know, producing the vast majority of the emissions that we're talking about. On the California side of pieces, we see, you know, the governor moving forward with the car piece of, you know, non-gas uh, burning cars. And those are commitments, you know, that we look at from the state level, but we can also be creative that way at the local level. Um, and I think one thing that a couple of their folks have touched on is that we need to, you know, we are the home to one of the top research universities in the world with a number of experts in climate change and particularly ones that are associated with ag. 
So I think as a city, we have a chance to not just do our part, but we can think larger in scale. Um, I think we need to partner with the county and university um, and make this region a global leader in fighting climate change. We can look at how we calculate that. You know, currently we don't base it on per capita, which is a piece that we need to look at. And as Kelsey mentioned, I think we can address that when we look at uh, the, the redoing the, uh, of the general pan, uh, plan itself. Um, you know, and exporting the research and the technology in the world is going to need if we're going to turn back the tide of what we're seeing. We're seeing it currently with all the extreme weather that we're facing. Um, locally, we're seeing some folks that are putting together, uh, there's a group that's working right now, which is exciting on um, it, the phrase is Tormia, which is totally recycled materials. And they're starting to look at ways that we can, can work together as a community and create repair cafes here in town. Um, and that's a, a group that's getting um, underway now. Thank you. Thank you, Josh. Connor, you're next. So I agree with Kelsey that dense infill is a major part of addressing uh, climate change. And really, we need people to be able to live near the destinations that they typically visit. So work, school and businesses. So I think we do need more density in Davis. And in particular, we need more density in and near the downtown and the campus. And I will add to that, that I think that this density also needs to make sure to address other issues as well. And in particular, I think affordability is a big part of it. I think affordability is important on its own, but it also relates to making, trying to make it so that people drive less and are able to walk or bike to their job or to school. Because there are a lot of students as well as a lot of downtown workers who cannot currently afford to live in Davis and have to commute from elsewhere. So I think making sure that we have this dense affordable housing that allows those students and workers to truly live near where they go to school or work is an important aspect that goes well with the density aspect as well. Thank you, Connor. Anybody have a secondary response? to this question about climate change? Okay, we'll go on to the next question. Uh, this is the fourth question out of six. The recently developed downtown plan will affect all residents of Davis and the new city council will be responsible for its implementation. What is your understanding of the status of the downtown plan and what are your top priorities for implementing it. And let's see, where's my... I think I'm first this time, uh, Bob. You're right. well, I'll just, I you're right. I'll Thanks start for helping you. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> um, so this is one that I will definitely be less familiar with than our other candidates who have served um, specifically on downtown um, business association and in this planning process. And I'm so glad that they have given their time to these important subjects and that this is something that, you know, was really meaningful for them. Um, I'm extremely disappointed that in the last 10 years, we've had an outdated general plan. And I'm glad that the downtown community has decided to kind of take this on themselves as update a plan for that area. Um, so I think, you know, thinking about the, the density of the downtown is something that I'm very passionate about and really thinking of ways where we can, you know, move people into that area to make it more of a destination rather than um, driving to a specific place and then leaving, um, making it more uh, pedestrian and bike friendly and really just increasing its ability to draw people um, for more than just a single place. Thank you, Kelsey. Josh? Thank you. Um, yeah, so I was on the downtown plan advisory committee. Uh, it was a plan that the city put together. They decided to do the downtown plan first before they tackle the general plan. So where it's at right now, um, the EIR, EIR is underway. We're looking at hopefully June, 2021. Um, that that can get wrapped up and be approved. Um, and again, the big piece of this is that it allows projects that fall within this plan to be covered by the EIR, covered by CEQA. 
Um, we know that there's six to eight documents roughly um, that people have to go through. Um, and we're looking at processing and streamlining uh, how that process works. Um, and it makes it easier to navigate for people that are looking to develop here. Um, you know, things that we address in that plan, missing middle housing, we know that was a big piece of it. As other folks have said, we need intense infill downtown and how we go about that has a number of, of benefits to it. Um, some of the main areas that we looked at focus in on, you know, the Hibbit Lumber Lot is a huge a space that we can look at and really do some, um, some really exciting things there and get people living, working, um, <laughs> shopping, eating, all that stuff in that area. Same thing with the um, Davis Ace um, uh, Hardware a uh, lot that they have there. Um, it also addresses, um, you know, leakage of people, the amount of people that are leaving town. Uh, we know that, you know, in this study in 2018, the market analysis was that 9,000 workers were coming into Davis and over 20,000 were leaving city limits to go to work. Uh, so we really do need to address that and look at um, what the effects are. Uh Thanks, Josh. Thanks. Connor, you're next. So, I really like the process for the downtown planning. Uh, so it's been going on for a few years now. Uh, and I really like the way that it incorporated community input. And as Josh said, it's still going and there's still even more opportunities for community input. So I, I really liked that aspect of it. Uh, I hope that something similar happens with the general plan update, and I wish something similar would happen with the housing specific element, but it seems like that one is on a much tighter timeline, which uh, I was a bit disappointed at how quickly the housing element needs to be completed and how late that process was started, but I really like the process for the downtown plan, and I think that is something that we need to emulate uh, in other city decisions. And in terms of the downtown itself, I like the idea of form-based code. And I think that the downtown is a great place for additional density. I do think that we need to make sure we have certain requirements and standards that we make sure that developers adhere to, especially around affordability, but I am in favor of the current plan. Thanks, Connor. Uh, Rochelle, you're last on this. Great, one. thank you. Um, no, I was actually very happy to be part of the council that brought the downtown plan uh, to fruition and put a lot of great people on it who put a lot of effort into that plan. Ideally, it would have been great to have a general plan first, um, having served on that very long and laborious uh, old process that we had. I am eager to see what comes new. I know that there's a lot of work in the consultant that's been hired for that. Um, and though COVID has slowed many things down, this kind of a format, I think, helps us be able to accelerate and actually make that a reality in the near future. Um, but as the downtown plan itself, the notice of preparation is expected to go out next week, which means that we'll have a draft EIR for the community to comment on. Typically that comment period can be 45 days. I would be in favor of making that a little longer, which we've done in the past for EIRs. Um, and I think as part of that noticing process, I would like to see it put into our utility bill. So every single resident in the town gets a notice um, as well as having it up on the website and making sure people are aware of what's happening. A really important part about the downtown plan is for certainty. And so any kind of investment requires certainty and that's why it went forward when it did. Uh, we would seen some great work come out of the parking uh, commission plan and knew that we could do an even bigger plan for the downtown and form-based codes was the right way to go. And so there's folks waiting some of the parcels that have been mentioned to do investment and being able to have a process in hand reduces their risk. And so um, I think that should be good. I don't have a hand signal on mine, but I would oh, like don't? to raise my hand. Yeah, I don't. <laughs> All right. I have a chat little thing. Everybody else has their, their hands raised. So uh, we'll go with Kelsey first. She she raised her hand first, then Connor, then Josh, then Rochelle. Okay. Go ahead, Kelsey. Great. So yes, form-based code, fantastic. Love it. Also would like to note that when you're thinking about commuter data in Davis, it's very, very uh, misleading because the university is outside of the city limits. And so what you're really talking about is including me as a commuter out of Davis because I, you know, 
am living in the city and working on the campus most of the time. So it's very misleading and you do not want to use that to say that, oh, we don't have enough jobs in Davis, for instance. Really, there are lots of people commuting to the university from Woodland, West Sac, other places, because they can't even find places to live in Davis. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Connor, you uh, had your hand up next. Yeah, so like I said, I'm in favor of the form-based code, but I do want to, again, emphasize the need to make sure we have other things in place, especially around affordability. And I also have been thinking about the idea of commercial rent control and or a commercial vacancy tax as a way to really incentivize the landowners downtown to lower their rents and make things easier for the small businesses and for redevelopment. Thank you. Josh, you're next. Yeah, thank you. So one thing that I've talked about in the meetings that I'm in and that I go to um, is, uh, and that I would commit to if I'm elected and push for, um, like I did previously, was representation on that committee. We had uh, 15 people, uh, community members voted on or that were appointed. There was one person of color on that committee, one woman of color. Everybody else was upper aged white people um, and it did not represent our community as a whole. Um, and if I am elected, I will make sure that when the general plan comes as a representative of district five, that I will have different folks of all different backgrounds, all different socioeconomic uh, status on that committee. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Rochelle? Yes, thank you. Um, so to finish my earlier thought too, was part of that was densification and more mixed use in the downtown. And I agree with some affordability as well. I think we can see the transformation um, for folks who have been around for a little while of even what happened in Midtown Sacramento. Um, and that was really one of the fuels behind moving it forward was we were seeing some deterioration in the downtown. And I do agree that as implementation comes forward, I think it'd be good to have a new committee. It's one of the things why I was supportive of district elections. Um, is seeing representation, not just from the districts, but more diversity that actually reflects the community. And part of that's gonna mean even improved outreach where people feel like they can have a voice. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, our fifth question is, um, the city faced financial problems before COVID. How can it dig out of an even deeper hole now? And um, Josh, uh, we'll start. Yeah, absolutely. Look, we obviously, the biggest key is to bring in more revenue. Um, that's obviously what it is. Bring in more revenue. What does that look like? Um, you know, it looks like building more housing. We have to look at redevelopment of properties. We need to look at increasing our tax base. Um, we need to look at infill. That's one of the things I'm so excited about, about with the downtown plan is to start doing and generating uh, redevelopment dollars in our downtown, increasing our sales tax base. Um, we also need to step back and look at our uh, grant writing process and how we prioritize um, grants that we go after. We currently have a con uh, consultant who writes grants for the city. Um, we're going to need to work hand in hand with them in order to make sure we're priori prioritizing um, you know, dollars that we really need to, to get into our community. Um, you know, the other piece we look at, again, is providing space for businesses to grow. Uh, when you look at some of the projects that have disc and some of the projects that have come up, we need incubators, we need space for these businesses to grow, create jobs, have housing, more people living, um, living within Davis um, to increase that tax base. Thank you. Uh, Connor, you're next. So I think that there are really two ways that the city council can try to address the city's fiscal issues. So first, indirectly, I think the city should use its platform to push for larger changes on the state and federal level. In particular, uh, universal healthcare would be helpful on its own and also likely reduce employee healthcare costs for cities. And we should also really be supporting Prop 15 in this cycle and similar things uh, to Prop 15 in the future. But then on the more direct side, uh, as I was saying in my previous response, I think that having downtown rent control and or vacancy tax would incentivize 
the landowners to allow more small businesses to move in. And that would be a good way to rejuvenate downtown, which would also be helpful on its own while simultaneously creating more revenue for the city. So I think I agree with Josh that revenue is important. Uh, and I think that this would be one way to generate more of it and simultaneously help jumpstart downtown. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Rochelle? The city has probably one of the largest roles to play in the economy. Um, and it's both process, it's also um, spending and it's revenue. Um, luckily, we have a better process. When I was elected in 2010, we uh, did not have a solid process. We were structurally imbalanced and we had a 3% growth rate even though we were in the height of a recession. And now we have quarterly check-ins, a two-year budget, um, as well as keeping control on the number of employees. That was very difficult to have to do cuts back then. And it, and it put us in a better place, but what's different now versus then, that was a housing bubble that really set things off. This is a global pandemic and we've had people out of work and businesses closed for months on end. And so I think it's gonna be very important uh, that we go and assess our budget in today's dollars. What do we have? What are we looking at? I know the current council you know, looked at doing furloughs and I think that's good for the, that was you know, working well with employees in the short term, but in the longer term, we need to think about what are the services? And again, that goes back to a community-wide conversation. These are conversations that should be happening at council now where, where it's on the forefront and people have an understanding of some of the trade-offs. Um, that includes looking at um, you know, what departments make sense. It also means having an environment that welcomes um, revenue generating opportunities and how do we you know, promote businesses. In my first term, we looked at, uh, created a small business um, account and I would like to see looking at that if we can utilize some of that loan program to actually help keep businesses online now and I'm raising my hand. Okay uh, let's see I think uh, go ahead then you're, you're the only hand that I see. Go ahead Rochelle. Part of that which which was in part of that which is important um, is being able to find those businesses. I mean we have some right now where they're having to pay their rent and they're at 25% of revenues and they've cut all they can. And I know the chamber did a good job of doing outreach, but I think it'd be good to see if the city had more creative programs like we did before. We've got to work with our federal and state partners. There's federal dollars and state dollars that are going to be there. I think maybe even doing an assessment, there were some projects that were put on hold, but potentially bringing them on if we know that we could get some support for funding so that we're really able to leverage everything we have. And I agree with Connor, I think there might be some reasons where we need to go and actually lobby um, for infrastructure and for other needs that we have at the local level. Thank you, thank you. I haven't answered this Kelsey, question yet. Yes, yeah, yeah, so I'm coming to you. Okay, go great. Ahead, Kelsey. <laughs> um, so it's a bit disappointing that after the longest period of growth in recent history that the city is not able to balance its budget in normal times. I understand that the pandemic has thrown things off for pretty much everyone. And so that's very understandable. But I think that, you know, we need to think not only how are we going to cover this short term gap where our expenditures are higher than our revenue, um, but how are we going to actually pre prepare for this type of thing in the future? Um, we know that, you know, natural disasters, other things are going to become more and more regular as climate change continues. Um, and so we need to be prepared for emergency situations. We need to be prepared for situations where, you know, suddenly revenue drops for whatever reason. Um, and so putting in place um, automatic saving mechanisms for the city so that we can have coffers to go to in this type of situation, um, I think is very important. Um, I also think that, you know, focusing on um, um, relationships that we have with uh, the state government and other uh, governmental bodies and the funds that are available there, that's going to be increasingly important. Um, and absolutely agree with Connor that Prop 15 and other similar measures will help not only the city, but everyone um, so that 
you know, we see less of uh, these large businesses. Thanks. Kelsey, would you like to, uh, would any uh, the three of you like to add a secondary response? If so, you, you have to unmute yourself. Oh, Kelsey has her hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, I'll, I'll just continue my sentence real quick. Yeah. <laughs> um, we see situations where businesses uh, own the majority of the land in areas, and that happens because you know, once you own it, you are paying such low taxes on it and that continues and you can just keep um, buying up more and more. Um, and so having Prop 15 in place allows for more equity in um, who's actually paying um, for the services that the city provides. Okay, Josh, would you like to have a secondary response there? Yeah, sure. Um, since we're talking prop 15 here as somebody who owns a business and uh, pays bills based on a business downtown uh, and went through the repurchasing and readjusting of rent due to all the John Brindley properties being sold I can tell you firsthand what the effect is on our downtown economy and locally owned businesses what it's going to be if prop 15 passes um, if this is a tough one they're balancing it against education right and what that looks like um, but we have seen what happens when, and in a forum before we've gone over them, the businesses that have gone out of business when John Brindley sold his property. That was a direct reflection of property taxes going up on businesses who are, who, whose um, owners live here, their kids go to school here and their business have closed. They didn't relocate. They didn't relocate for the most part, a few did in Davis, the rest of them went out of business. Thank you, Josh. Kelsey had her hand up again for a second secondary response, which is legal. Awesome. Um, yeah, so I'd just like to address uh, address Josh's last comment. The idea of Prop 15 is that that wouldn't be happening anymore. You wouldn't see these huge jumps when property does get sold. There is a, a process for um, transitioning into a more equitable system of assessing property taxes more regularly um, so that when property changes hands, you don't see these huge shocks. So yes, I think it's going to be very, very difficult as it comes into implementation. But once we're fully implemented with a more equitable property tax system, um, we'll see a lot more regularity. Thank you, Connor. You have your hand up. Yeah, so I was going to say a lot of what Kelsey just said, um, but essentially the idea is that at least in the long term, it would not only directly generate revenue, but also potentially even incentivize lower rents and maybe even incentivize selling property to actual business owners instead of these large corporations holding a lot of it. And in the short term, I do wonder if commercial rent control would be a way to help mitigate some of the potential negative impacts. Thank you. Rochelle, since your, your hand doesn't work, do you, would you like a, another response or? I don't yes, and, and I mean, it is good that Prop 15 came up in this because honestly what happened with the Brindley property was a big motivator to get the downtown plan up and off the ground um, to be able to, to, in, to get investment, but also to be very aware of what can happen when property changes hands. Um, I think that if it does pass, it's in, gonna be imperative that the city um, work together with the businesses immediately that are impacted um, by those changes and actually come up with a plan of, of what would that transition look like? What do businesses need to stay? Um, and, and how do we keep the folks that are here without them assuming that they either need to shut down or move their businesses elsewhere, but really give them an opportunity um, from something else. Thank you. Kelsey, do you have your hand up again or did you just leave your hand up? Okay, thank you. Oh, Kelsey, go ahead. My bad. Okay. No, I, right. I'm done, thank you. All right, all right. So uh, we're, we're close to six o'clock. So um, we're gonna go to uh, closing statements and uh, just a message to the audience. This is your, if you have a audience question, please email it to ask.lwvda at gmail.com. It's in the chat, it's in the chat. And uh, we've received some questions already. So 
Uh, we're going to take closing statements, and then we're going to have a little interlude by Mary Jo. She's going to talk a little bit about the League of Women Voters, and then we'll start on the audience questions. So um, let's see, uh, Connor, uh, you are up first for your closing statement. So I have been involved in Davis politics for quite a while now, and I have been involved in both city related issues as well as grassroots movements and direct actions. And I believe that I can bring both of those perspectives to the city council where I have some background in what the city council does and how it functions. Obviously not as much as someone who was on it previously, but still a decent amount. And simultaneously I have connections to community groups and community organizations, especially with the most marginalized. And I believe that I can bring those perspectives to the council and really address the needs of the community, especially those who are most marginalized. Thank you. Um, Rochelle, you're next. Uh, and uh, uh, closing statements are one minute. Great, thank you. Um, yes, yeah, so circling back to the beginning of, of why I was asked to run this time, I think it's important through these tumultuous times to have continuity, compassion, and experience. Uh, we have a different, none of the current city council members was on council during the last recession. Neither was the city manager, nor the finance director. Um, and that is why I was asked to step back in. And I think that's clearly reflected of my track record getting us through the last uh, recession and the recovery is, is reflected in all the endorsements that I have from leaders that are very aware at multiple levels, both at the regional and state um, and beyond of what we have. TOT is one of those examples alone. Uh, they're looking at that industry, maybe not coming back for another four to six, maybe even eight years. So we're going to have to get really smart about what we're doing. And um, with my known uh, leadership and experience, I like, want to offer myself to be able to, again, serve this community, uh, not just District 5, but the whole city. Thank you. Thanks, Rochelle. Uh, Kelsey, you're up next for your closing <laughs> I was having an interesting conversation. It was very brief the other day. I saw a little dog along um, Second Street out, you know, on the way, you know, right beside the railroad tracks on the way out to um, to Target area. And um, um, this little dog belonged to a man who had been living along that bike path. Um, and so I spoke with him and I asked him what he'd like to see in Davis because he's been living here actually longer than I have, eight years along that bike path. Um, I think it's important to have people on your council who are actually reaching out to all of these people who don't generally have the connections. We hear about endorsements. Yeah, those are all well-connected people who are you know, have a voice on their own. We need to be talking to the people who don't have a voice. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Um, Josh, uh, Josh, you're up next. Thank you. Um, so as I mentioned in my opening statement, the sense of responsibility to my community has what is what has led me to run for Davis City Council. Um, my background as a business owner and my background as an educator um, both of those, I think, uniquely positions me to help lead the city through, this, uh, through these times. Um, we know our community is facing unprecedented challenges um, from the global pandemic to, uh, you know, the issues which have led to social justice demonstrations um, that are sweeping our community, our nation. Um, I think in the face of these challenges, you know, I want to lead Davis through the tough decisions um, that are coming our way. Um, and the way that we as a city handle these issues must reflect the community's values. Um, and I wanna lead with the values of inclusivity, diversity, community and sustainability. Um, and I look forward to earning your vote. Thank you, Josh. This concludes our closing statements. Now we have a message from our league president, Mary Jo Bryan, while we collate audience questions. Thank Mary you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Um, 
Thank you. I really appreciate the opportunity to talk about the League because it's something that's near, near and dear to my heart. Um, the League of Women Voters of Davis was born in 1957 under the leadership of a future Davis mayor, Sandy Motley. It grew, out, it grew into a vibrant nonpartisan organization and thrived for many years. After years of dedicated service to the Davis community, the leadership faced the reality of diminishing active members and a lack of younger men members to take over the leadership. The league disbanded in 2014. However, in May of 2019, four individuals, Bob Fung, myself, Georgina Valencia, and Matt Williams met over coffee to discuss how to recreate and reestablish the League in Davis. That initial group of four researched the organization and the history of the Davis League and followed the steps established by the State League um, to renew the League. The State League on August 4, 2019, announced the Davis chapter as an official status. Our, court, our current board members include myself, Mary Jo Bryan, Bob Fung, who is our vice president and voter service chair, Judy Higgerson, who is the membership chair and voter registration chair, and Como Hawk, social media and, and marketing chair. The health care uh, committee chair is Michelle Famula. Along with the five of us, we are grateful for all the members who are actively working to provide nonpartisan community forums, voter education material, and get out the vote in the upcoming November 3rd election. Highlights during the first year include forums on the Davis General Plan, housing discrimination and uh, affordable housing, two health care forums, and local candidates forum for the county supervisor, city council, school board, and voter registration with league members uh, and voter registration where league members helped 1,300 UC Davis students register to vote for the 200, 2020 primary election. Now we are partnering with the Yolo County Elections Department regarding assisting with their get out the vote effort. Almost 3,000 3, uh, how to register uh, pamphlets, flyers in English and Spanish have been distributed through the food bank, Meals on Wheels and the li library. League has been asked again to assist at UC Davis to serve as do docents to the ballot drop-offs and to voter assistance. Cur currently, we have close to 130 members, including six men and 24 household members committed to providing nonpartisan community ed education. So I invite all men and women to consider membership in or donation to the League of Women Voters Davis area. Our education fund is a 501c3 and supports activities like the, the one that you are attending today. We appreciate your participation and invite you to check out our website at www.lwvdavisarea.org. We are stronger together and together we make democracy work. I'm Thanks, sure. Joe. Is that got the questions ready? Got the questions ready. Perfect timing. Thank you Thanks very much. Okay, uh, for the audience questions, uh, candidates will have um, one minute uh, to answer the questions, and then if they would like a thirty-second secondary response for each question. Um, and uh, the first question will go to. Rochelle, and the first question is um, about the CLAW. Do you believe the current schedule of the CLAW pickup is appropriate, all things considered? If yes, explain what makes suspension of that pickup for several months appropriate. If no, explain what you would advocate to be done. Great question, all right. Um, especially right now with all the leaves everywhere. Uh, all things considered, I like that, whoever wrote it. Um, yeah, it would be great to have more claw pickup, all things considered, absolutely. One of the reasons why this schedule was taken down was also looking at the ability for people to be able to pay uh, their, their pickup bill, people that for water, sewer and garbage. And that was a way of smoothing it out. Um, and if there was a lot of equipment that needed to be replaced as well at the time. 
And so it was a way of trying to balance. It's the same thing with the cart sizes. How do we balance to where um, it's not overburdensome for people um, who are on limited incomes, but it still is accessible enough. And then we also, of course, have the big cart for our composting um, to help with the week to week. I think being able to schedule pickup times would be nice and be easier. And I think it would be good to do a reassessment and maybe see if there are even ways where uh, folks have better access, even if they just need maybe by street by street or by neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's see, uh, Kelsey, you're next. Yeah, so the claw was a very new thing for me when I moved to Davis. Um, that's not a thing other places. <laughs> Most people have to, you know, transport their own waste to the, um, to the proper facilities if they have a ton of waste like that. And that's what I've always been used to. Um, so the fact that we have the claw at all is really a very, very nice thing that the city, it's a great service that the city provides. I do think we need to rethink how often we need the CLAW um, with the implementation of compost throughout the city. Um, really, we should be focusing on using, utilizing those compost bins before we're putting things on the street. As someone who bikes everywhere, um, large piles of um, debris in the bike paths is um, hinders a lot of us in our way, our main way of getting around town. So I would really prefer we switch to primarily using the compost bins um, and utilize the claw only when necessary. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Josh? Thanks. Um, yeah, I think what we've learned uh, from this is that it's really hard to take something away that people are used to having. Um, it would say uh, practices a lot of patience uh, when I can imagine when we're, people are getting phone calls about this. But I, uh, you know, I, I think that we should find a way to make the claw be able to come back. People aren't adhering to it. Um, in my neighborhood in South Davis, there are always piles and piles and piles of dead debris. What we're seeing now people doing is clearing stuff, putting on the street and then once a week filling their cart and then leaving all the rest of the stuff on the streets. Um, and it is still continuing to be a hazard from, as Kelsey said, a bicycling standpoint, but also just in terms of uh, they catch on fire or things like that, or kids getting in them, all that type of stuff. Uh, but I also think that we can, we can figure out a way to go like a block by block, a neighborhood could schedule a pickup and that once a month that neighborhood can have a pickup. So it's not every single week to try and mitigate some of the costs that comes in with that. Um, and it'd be more of a community organized um, event. Okay. Thanks, Josh. Um, let's see, um, Connor, you're, you're last. Yeah. So like Kelsey and Josh, I also think that we really need to emphasize the use of bins. I know when the claw came up at city council a little while ago, the, the debris and bike paths was a major concern that a lot of people brought up around even having the claw as a concept to begin with. So I do think that we should emphasize bins that are not in bike paths or the street as much as possible. Uh, I do think that we should reconsider the schedule of the claw and that might even be a way to mitigate the effects of the hazards that are associated with debris piles. But I think that would have to be a larger conversation that involves people in different neighborhoods, especially because if people are like biking and there's piles in one neighborhood, but not another, it's still. Thank you. Thank you. And would you, anybody like to, uh, okay, uh, Rochelle has her hand up. I just I think it, it bears adding to this conversation because that is the compost bins. They are great. Um, and that's also, there's an issue for some people that are less able-bodied than others, especially we have a wide range in our community um, of different age groups and different abilities. And I know that there are some folks that they express concern that they are unable to utilize their bins. Um, and sometimes we rely neighbor to neighbor. I know I love using my big bin and sometimes we're able to share um, our, our piles. But I think when we have that conversation, again, I think when it comes to not just timing and convenience, and certainly we wanna be safe, but also just how it impacts people and how they're able to utilize it. Connor, would you like to 
have a secondary response? 30 seconds. Yeah, so that that is a really good point around accessibility. And that's something that has come up in Davis a lot in general around other issues too. And I think that's something that we should incorporate into Davis decisions more broadly. And I wonder if there are ways to implement certain things for people who need it while still having the larger policy apply to most people uh, who do not have those accessibility needs. Kelsey. Yeah, I would just like to agree with her that treating everyone as if they can't use a compost bin, um, that's going to lead to suboptimal use and more piles on the street than are actually necessary. And so if we want to talk about accessibility, well, then we need to be thinking specifically about people who have those needs and providing them services, not providing services to the general public um, to deal with accessibility issues. Thanks, Kelsey. Uh, our next uh, audience question is about the mace mess. Uh, many Davis citizens have pointed to the mace mess as an example of a failure by the city in transparency, public disclosure and public engagement, as well as an, as well as an example of how city processes are reactive rather than proactive. What have you learned from the mace mess situation that causes you to agree or disagree with those assessments? And we start with Kelsey. Great. Yes, I absolutely agree that the Mace Mess is a fantastic example of the city not engaging with the, commun with the community members who are going to be affected. Um, my understanding is that the idea was to make that area uh, more bike and pedestrian friendly. I can assure you that it is not bike or pedestrian friendly at this time. Um, having bike bicycle lane troughs is uh, very, very less than ideal um, for bikers. It's very easy to end up hitting your pedals. Um, so while this solution may not have actually solved the problem it was aimed at, it's also caused problems for the wider community. And I think that what we need to, we need to focus on is the fact that um, it's taken a lot of time and a lot of angry people to even get the city to start talking about this. We need to be much more engaged and willing to admit. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Josh, you're next. Thank you. One minute to answer. This one's going to be one tough. minute. <laughs> yeah, holy moly. Um, yeah, so there's definitely transparency issues. Uh, I know that there were some community meetings and things that happened early on. Um, I think this is a great example of what this moving to district elections, what it's going to provide. This is going to provide somebody in our community in South Davis with a voice. It's going to provide this community with somebody who's going to pay attention to what's happening. This was on, this was voted on and approved from 2013 up. Um, and it's a responsibility of the city council to see these projects through. Yes, they go to different commissions. Yes, these things happen. Ultimately, the buck stops with the people that are sitting up at the council voting. This project, it was millions of dollars was spent. They would not spend wisely. We are now talking about spending over $3 million to possibly try and fix this and redoing this, this whole section um, that, was, that was done in a way where we did not have oversight or community engagement throughout the process. Um, and if I'm elected to council, um, I can guarantee you that I'll be in those meetings and leading those meetings um, and keeping our community engaged in that conversation. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Connor, you, it's your turn to respond. Yeah, so I'm glad this came up because this is a very uh, important issue to South Davis and one that I didn't uh, have the time to respond to mention earlier. Uh, but I do think that this process was very flawed in a lot of ways and that there were a lot of issues around the decision to make changes. And I am supportive of trying to create more bike infrastructure, but the way that the city council went about it uh, definitely had a lot of flaws. Thank you. Connor, Rochelle, you're last on this question. Yeah, thank you. And it's an important question. And I think what it highlights sometimes is when we get grant dollars for capital improvement projects, 
that drag on for many years, the need to continually circle back. There were open houses in the beginning. There was a, a council subcommittee and it did go back multiple times to uh, the Bike and Transportation Commission. And clearly there were not enough um, community outreach meetings where folks were able to be there. And sometimes that's because there needs to be multiple meetings, um, more than just one or two. And that is the beauty of being able to see um, when there is a problem and you know how to fix it and make it better. Um, I was happy to see the Mace Covell thing fixed because I remember myself as, as a parent dealing with that intersection for years um, and then even just as a resident going down Mace Boulevard. And what turned out, what was actually built is not what was envisioned. Um, yeah, I was actually coming off the council as it was going to construction. And I myself found my very frustrated of uh, sitting there and seeing the problems. And the other big issue on a long project like this is traffic. And the changes from 2013 to 2017, 2018 are significant waves being a very good example of that. Thank you. Um, I'm not exactly sure. I think Kelsey was the first to put her hand up on her. And uh, just uh, uh, Rochelle, would you want a secondary response as long as you're talking then? I'll, I'll give, you'll be the fourth one. Okay, thank you. Kelsey? Yeah, I just wanted to finish the thought of the city council being willing to admit that this situation created an issue and that it was a mistake and that it needs to be fixed and fixing it quickly. Actually being willing to address when you have made a mistake. Um, I think is really important. It has taken a lot of community members a lot of time to get this back to the forefront of the conversation. Um, I've spoken to quite a few people who, you know, have engaged with even the county because the city was just not willing to engage about this. Thank you. Thank you, Kelsey. Uh, Connor, I think you're next. Yeah, so... I was just saying that I think it's important to increase the bike infrastructure here, but the way that it was gone about definitely had issues. And it really gives us uh, some knowledge going forward about how to take into account community input and how that's very important and some of the best ways to do so. Um, this gives us knowledge of that. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Josh, you're next. Thank you. Yeah, so to be clear, I mean, it's not safer now than it was before. Um, and it is not just an issue about ways traffic. We, the, the infrastructure of that road is extremely dangerous to kids riding bikes, to people commuting to and from work, and for emergency vehicles trying to get somewhere. So it, yes, there's more traffic, but the infrastructure itself was fumbled and the design was awful. And again, this was approved and looked after um, and then implemented. Yes, traffic is an issue and some of the backup is because of ways, but it's more of a safety issue on that street. Thank you. Thanks, Josh. Uh, Rochelle, you're last. Yes, thank you. And, and, um, and I agree with the comment. It's good when you can see the mistakes are made and you make the process better. I um, mean, with that in mind, I think it's important on the fix since we only have the county looking at a 30%. Um, I think we should look and if measure uh, B passes and just passes that we need to have a full look at, at MACE before we go spending more money on the Southern portion and do a fully engaged community charrette for all the communities on both sides of MACE Boulevard that actually reflects the needs from a safety bike, ped and car um, perspective. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, we have time for one more question. Um, and the, the question is about uh, DISC. Um, what is your position on Measure B? And if Measure B is approved, how will it affect downtown and Mace traffic? And uh, Josh, you're first to go. Sorry, as I said before, I had issues from the beginning on how this project came up. Um, it did not go through the regular process uh, when, once it was pulled as Mace Ranch Innovation, Innovation Center and then it came back. Um, so that being said, I, I have issues um, with this project from, from that standpoint. I am somebody who has advocated for and will still continue to advocate for development. We need a place for businesses to grow. We need a place for, for businesses to have the incubation period when they, when they start. We need places for students to, when they graduate, to have a place to get a job. Um, and also we know the build out on DISC is a long time build out. We know that, that period is a 20 year 
build out. Um, and we talk about fiscal, you know, infrastructure and what we're doing from the city standpoint, we need revenue. Uh, and this project is going to be able to provide that, provide a huge chunk of revenue to our city. Okay. Thank you very much. Connor. So I support DISC in that I think having it is better than not having it under the current system. I do recognize that there are a lot of important concerns there. And I think we need to address and acknowledge those concerns. But I do think that the benefits outweigh the negatives under the current system. And I don't think I need to repeat the benefits because I'm sure people have heard those already. In terms of mitigating the negatives, I think traffic is going to be a major aspect of that. But I think that there are ways to mitigate that by really creating stronger infrastructure for pedestrians and biking, as well as incentivizing the use of mass transit and really uh, having bus lines that are more frequent and that uh, go to a variety of places rather than being primarily centered around the university and those types of things. Thank you, Connor. Uh, Rochelle? Yes, I believe the question was specifically the impacts on downtown and Mace Boulevard. And, and uh, yes, let me just read the question again for you. Uh, what is your position on Measure B? And if Measure B is approved, how will it affect downtown and Mace traffic? Um, as stated earlier, I do support Measure B for a number of reasons, but I want to be specific to this question. I think the impacts on the downtown can actually be profound and positive. Uh, there is within the agreement to be able to have transport between the downtown and the project. And we need more people that utilize our downtown, whether or not it's our retailers um, or whether it's our restaurants and, and our art galleries and all the vibrancy that's down there. I think by bringing in these jobs and bringing in families and graduate students who are staying here and moving their lives here will actually help us have a lot more vibrancy in the downtown. Um, on Mace Boulevard, it will bring additional funds for infrastructure that can greatly improve um, both North and South Mace Boulevard and um, ideally be able to also leverage and maximize the changes that are happening to I-80 with Caltrans over the near future. And so I think that it can be positive um, and being able to smartly plan those issues and those impacts um, can actually mitigate uh, and offset uh, the additional traffic that would take time to build out. Thanks, Rochelle. Uh, Kelsey? Yeah, so if you'd like to know more about what we think um, specifically about DISC, um, the Vanguard asked us about this specific um, project um, in, I believe, their week three question. So you can take a look back at that if you want to know more about my view on DISC as a whole, um, as it relates specifically to downtown um, and Mace Boulevard, I would have to say, I think there's going to be a large negative impact on Mace. We already see traffic backing up on Mace and with the addition of potentially around 6,000 jobs, um, in the DISC area, you're going to be talking about creating a many, many, many more commuters. Um, housing is going to be very limited. As we all know, housing is very limited in Davis. There's not a lot of vacancies. So you're going to be creating thousands of new commuters. This is going to be a huge burden on Mace Boulevard, specifically around um, those morning and evening evening commuting times. Um, as for downtown, I don't think that there will be a whole lot of effect, to be honest. Um, there we go. Thank you, Kelsey. Maybe you can finish your response in a in your secondary uh, 30 seconds. Connor, you're, you're up first. Yeah, so I also think that housing is an important aspect of the question around traffic. Uh, but I do think that we could mitigate for that by really thinking through uh, building more and denser housing in Davis that's truly affordable for workers in different areas. Uh, and then, as I was saying, I do think that there are ways to mitigate the traffic directly and that the funding from DISC could be used to really help improve some of that bike infrastructure 
and mass transit and all of those types of things as well. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thank you. So I think one important piece to think about here when it relates to downtown is that just because DISC is being built over in South Davis doesn't mean it's all of a sudden gonna have a big impact on downtown. Um, it's not niche. It's not a, a place where you can walk from that location to downtown. So what are we gonna need? We're gonna need to have somebody who is having conversations between our downtown um, business organizations, the chamber and downtown uh, the DDBA to talk about how we can encourage and promote folks leaving DISC to come downtown to shop, eat, play. Um, so that is something that I have done. I've worked with the folks that run Legacy to try and get people from there over to downtown to spend money. Um, it's gonna take um, a lot of work to try and get, you know, break that barrier. Thank you. Kelsey, I see your hand, Rochelle. Yes, so continuing my previous thought on downtown, um, well, they do say that there's going to be some sort of shuttle type service. I'd really like to see just funding of the Z line, which currently passes right by where DISC will be, and then goes to downtown. It goes right past the train station. So there's this already exists. We just, they should be required to fund it and have it run more frequently um, if we want it to benefit the downtown area. Um, overall, <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Kelsey, uh, Rochelle, you, you are the, uh, the last one to respond. Uh, you have 30 seconds. Great. Um, no, and I'm already in talks with folks that are used to doing uh, these kinds of projects, especially as it relates to downtown and even in college towns. And the beauty is, is there are ways right up front. Um, some of the companies that are interested and very much understand our downtown and that we're a college town. And that's actually one of their amenities that they are trying, that they're going to want to sell to their own folks as to why they want to be able to see that. And they want to be engaged sooner rather than later. So I anticipate if there's a positive vote November 3rd, that we're going to see a lot of activity um, of folks having these meetings with DDBA, with the chamber and with the city council. Thank, Thank you very you. much. This, uh, uh, as you can see, it's uh, right at 6.30, and uh, that, uh, this concludes our uh, District 5 candidate forum. Um, thank you to uh, the candidates for your participation and to the audience. Uh, the forum has been recorded and will be available on our Facebook page, uh, which is uh, facebook.com slash LWV Davis area by tomorrow, and then it will be uh, also available on DCTV. We have a short survey for you. When you leave the Zoom forum, uh, you might be asked uh, to fill out a full, uh, survey. And if you have a few minutes, we would appreciate, appreciate your feedback. Thanks very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.